So if you open your Bibles, please, to Jeremiah chapter 8. Real quickly, of course, in way of review, Jeremiah was a prophet to the southern kingdom uh, about, uh, uh, well, 586, a little bit before that, um, to the southern kingdom. And, uh, of course, the, as, we, as we look at it, uh, we call him the weeping prophet. And uh, he preached even though he really sadly didn't see any change. Um, but, you know, this is what you and I are to do. Um, we are to share God's word. Uh, preaching, we're to share God's word with witnessing. Uh, that's, that's what our, our responsibility is, and we leave the results with God. Praise the Lord for those who, gets, those who get saved. Um, we'd love to see that every time, wouldn't we? Every time we witness or every time we preach, people get saved. Um, but our real responsibility, the results are in God's hands. Our responsibility is to give out the word, as Jeremiah's responsibility was to preach the word. Um, and you do all you can, and you and I should do all that we can to help people see the truth of God, know the truth of God, and, and believe the truth of God, and obey the truth of God. This is your objective. This is my objective, for people to know God's word and to live it. And that was Jeremiah's. Well, in Jer uh, Jeremiah chapter 8, and then we'll quickly go over review, but you know, as a, more of an informal Bible study, would you just follow, you don't have to stand, but I, I'm going to read verses 8 through 17. All right, you know what, I'm going to go 8 through 22. It's a little long passage, but I want to ask this question, and you just follow with me, is more or less this, this, the theme. And as I read this scripture, and you follow with me, what is the result of rejecting God's word. What are the results of rejecting God's word? When people know what God says, but they, say, they reject it, what will happen? What will happen? Verse 8. How do you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord. And what wisdom is in them? Therefore will I give their wives unto others, and their fields to them that shall inherit them. For every one from the least even unto the greatest is given to covetousness, from the prophet even unto the priest. Every one dealeth falsely. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. In the time of their visitation, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. I will surely consume them, saith the Lord. There shall be no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree, and the leaf shall fade, and the things that I have given them shall pass away from them. Why do we sit still, assemble yourselves, and let us enter into the defense cities, and let us be silent there? For the Lord our God hath put us to silence, and hath given us water of gall to drink, because we have sinned against the Lord." We look for peace, but no good came. For a time of health, and behold, trouble. The snorting of the horses was heard from Dan, that's the far north. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones. For they are come and have devoured the land, and all that is in it, the city and those that dwell therein. For, behold, I sent serpents and cockatrices, that's poisonous snakes, among you, which will not be charmed, you can't charm them, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. When, and many believe this is a prayer of Jeremiah, when I would comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint within me. Behold the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people, because of them that dwell in a far country, of course that's Babylon, is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? 
The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I am black. Astonishment hath taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Well, let's pray, shall we, and ask God to bless our study. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity we have to gather as your people, to pray with and for each other. Thank you that those were able to come out tonight and pray your blessing on them. Thank you for those who are watching live stream. Pray your blessing on them. We think of our other ministries going on now with the Awana program. Bless that, we pray. We also think of the parenting series. Bless that ministry. And also we pray and thank you for answers of prayer for Don's brother and continue to meet his needs. And I pray all will go well for his wife's surgery tomorrow. We pray now you bless your word to our hearts and lives. And again, thank you for your goodness and grace and your blessings to us. Pray for Pastor and Jody to have a wonderful, happy, joyful, safe, and blessed trip to and from Canada and bless mightily their niece's wedding this weekend. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, real quickly, uh, as we take our little green hand out here, and just a couple weeks ago when we review, Jesus alluded to Tophet, which was become the reference of hell in the New Testament. In other words, he used outside of Jerusalem. It was, a, it was, the, it was the dump. It was the burning dump. It was the garbage. And it, it, it continually burned. And hell was the place of future employment called Gehenna, or the Gehenna of fire. This was originally the Valley of Hinnon, south of Jerusalem, where the filth and dead animals of the city were cast out and burned, a fit symbol of the wicked and their future destruction. Remember, Jesus described hell as a place where the worm dieth not and what the fire is not what? Quenched. A very awful place. The prophet and all prophets, a prophet is a spokesman for God. What was his job? What was his responsibility? Well, he was a servant of the Lord. He served God. And his purpose was to repeat, review, and revive God's truth for the people to know, believe, and obey what God says. Very simple. But in other words, he repeated. It wasn't really any uh, new type revelation, but going back to what God said, reviewing it, say, we need this now. And God's truth for the people to know what he says to believe what he says, and that's trust what he says, and then obey what he says. I love in Psalm 100, it says, his truth endureth to all generations. Isn't that wonderful? That this precious book that God has given us, it's for the here and now, it's for not only our children, but our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. His truth endureth to all generations. What a joy that is. All right, the rejection of restoration. Well, we looked here uh, at, at the uh, sadly the, the uh, rejection if you turn to page 2 we found that if we receive God's word and then apply it our fellowship with God will be restored we're going to learn a very important principle tonight we won't get through I don't think we'll get through the whole little uh, handout that I gave you but I really want us to focus on one major biblical principle and we'll look at that but in way of review, it was sadly, it was from the leaders down to the people. You know, they say everything rises and falls on what? Leadership. Leadership. And that is important. But you know what? You and I are responsible to live for God. You know, um, even if our leaders fail us, even if our leaders fail us, you and I are still responsible. It makes it more difficult, doesn't it? Uh, if our leaders fail us. And yet you and I have that responsibility. Live for God no matter what. You put God first in your life no matter what. You know, Martin Luther said, God and I are a majority. And that is the most important relationship that you will have in your life is your relationship with God. You make him first. You and I are to make him first in our lives. Live for God no matter what you face. No matter what trial, what difficulty, what struggles, we all go through them, live for God. But their rebellion was the potentates, the leaders, the princes, the prophets, the priests, the people. They chose false worship. They chose 
death. They refuse to return to the Lord. And he even gives an illustration of the migratory birds that, well, they know when to go, when they should go, and where they should go, and the way they should go, and they actually go. But the wrong response was of Judah. Well, let's look now specifically and just highlighting some of these wonderful truths, the rejection of God's truth. I want you to notice um, verses 8, 9, and 11 with me, please, on Roman number 4, their contrivances. I want you to notice that when they reject God's word, they go by their own wisdom. That's the contrivance. They go by what they think they should do. It reminds you, everybody does that which is right in their own eyes. They, they weren't thinking, what does God want us to do? They were thinking, what should we do? And we need, you know, what does the Bible say? If any lack what? Wisdom. wisdom let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. What's that mean? Well, the idea there is wisdom is what we should do. You know, when I uh, uh, meet people in the hospital and they have illnesses, and, and you know, I, I pray, you know what I always pray? I pray, Lord, to lead the medical personnel. We're going to look a little bit at medicine tonight. But I ask the Lord to lead the medical folks to do the very best for whatever is needed for that person. The very first. You see, how many have ever had, how many of you have ever had surgery? Anybody here? Oh my, my. Not too many. <laughs> no, I just, it seems like everybody raised their hand, okay? How many just love their surgery? No, I get, okay. Uh, and, well, if, if, if you that, well, some, see, and you're all here, so it, probably pretty good, okay? It worked out pretty well. All right. But in other words, you, and how many before your surgery, you had to have some tests? Anybody here, you had to go, had to have an MRI or an x-ray, or, right? And, and boy, sometimes, you know, you know, stress tests, and, oh, they're, they're hard, they're difficult, like, wow, you know? But those tests provide knowledge. In other words, what's going on? Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, not putting doctors down. I mean, my grandfather, and my uncle were medical doctors, but 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 they're 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 mechanics of the body. They're mechanics of the body. That's what they are. They've studied and studied and thought about studying, but how our body works. It's a, how anybody think we we just happened is ridiculous, isn't it? Not. I mean, we're designed by a designer, God Almighty, and He makes it all work together. It's wonderful. We're marvelously made. Uh, but anyhow, but when something isn't working right, okay, well, we've got to find out what isn't working right. And why isn't it working right? So you go through these tests. Well, the tests provide knowledge, okay? And knowledge is what you could do, okay? The, the, in other words, you, I, I look at the, okay, this is the situation we could do. We could have surgery. You could have medicine. You could have therapy. And maybe sometimes... You don't do anything, okay? And that's knowledge is what you could do. But wisdom, we need knowledge. But wisdom is a little bit more specific. N wisdom is what you should do. See the difference? In other words, what I could do, I need that knowledge. You got to go through those tests, even though they're hard to go through and they're sometimes unpleasant. And yet, it provides the medical personnel knowledge of what's going on. Okay, this is how we can tackle this. This is how we can treat this. This is what we can do in wisdom. But see, they went by their own wisdom. They weren't asking for God's wisdom. So notice 8, 9, and 11. How do you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and have taken. They have rejected. See, they rejected God's wisdom. They rejected, the, one of us would say, the word of the Lord. And the wisdom, and, and what wisdom is in them, is in them. Well, they don't have God's wisdom. They go by their own wisdom, the worldly wisdom, the worldly way. And then verse 11, for they healed the herd of the daughter of my people, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. When there is no peace. Isaiah says there's no peace with the what? With the wicked, right? No peace. But then also, notice their covetousness. So the contrivances, and then their covetousness. Verse 10, notice, therefore I will give their wives and others. This is sad. This, in other words, it's judgment. 
and their fields to them that shall inherit them. For every one of them, least unto the greatest, is given to covetousness. Covetousness. In other words, in other words, it was greed. I want more, more, more. Give me, give me, give me. Thou shalt not covet. The tenth commandment, right? Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Now it's not wrong to want nicer things. That's not that's not sin in and of itself. But if that's all, if that's what you and I dwell on, that's what God's talking about. You don't dwell on it. Be thankful for what you have. Be thankful. Be content. Apostle Paul said, he was, you know, he learned to whatever he faced in life. He said, you know what, I, I, I guess what, I'm, I'm content because God's with me. God's there. God has a purpose. But oh my, isn't that sad? Notice what it says there. Given from the greatest is given from the prophet, from the spokesman for a man who's supposed to represent God to the people. And a priest was a man representing the people to God. They were all given to covetousness. And notice what it says with me, please. Uh, everyone dealeth falsely in the deceit falsely. Well, what are the consequences? The contrivances, the covetousness. Notice in the outline there, the consequences. Bitterness of spirit. Verse 11 with me. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And then skipping down to verse 14. Why do we sit still? Assemble yourselves and let us enter into the defense cities. And let us be silent there. For the Lord our God hath put us to silence and given us water of gall to drink because we have sinned against the Lord. We have rejected God. We've broken his law. We've gone against his truth. And sadly, there's bitterness of spirit. Bitterness. Of spirit. What does the Bible tell? Let no bitterness right? We're not to be bitter, all right? That's a sin, is to be bitter. Uh, and, um, and, and, and uh, oh, bitterness, it just eats at you. It's like a cancer. It'll eat you, and, and, and bitterness will come out, and it'll, it'll come out in wrath. It'll come out in being mean and cruel, and, and, and people are bitter. They were a bitter spirit. Well, they're bitter because they they didn't ask God. They didn't ask God for help. They didn't say, God, please help us. No, they rebelled against God. And then, barrenness of food. Notice verse 13 with me. I will surely consume them, saith the Lord, part of judgment. There shall be no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree, and the leaf shall fade, and the things that I have given them shall pass away from them. Shall pass away from them. You know, when... Uh, how many of you have gardens? Anybody here have a garden? You have gardens? Okay. All right. Amen. Oh, just a few. Isn't it? I, I just love having a garden, you know? It's, I mean, it's, it's just, it's such a blessing. Um, and you always get excited, you know, when you see your first pepper or zucchini or tomato. What do you get excited about, Brother Wilson, when you see your, <laughs> when you see your what? What, pardon? Oh, oh yeah, that, I don't like that either. Yeah, I use deer scram, by the way. It works pretty good. I use another thing. Right? So, uh, yeah, you have to be, yeah, the deer. I know people. But um, it is exciting to see that, and, and it's, it's amazing. Um, but, you know, that's from God. God is, God is good. But um, I remember, 19, anybody here remember 1999? Anyone? Summer? Remember how dry it was? I didn't have to mow my lawn. I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. I did not have to mow my lawn for seven weeks. That was a blessing. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> but oh my, I could sit all day, all day there with a water hose and the hardly garden grow at all because apparently it had nitrogen or something. But see, that's from God. I mean, we have to realize we're, you know, in him we live and move and have our being. And God is the one who gives us the physical uh, food. And he's the one that helps us physically. But here's part of the judgment is, is, is judgment, the barrenness of food. And then here, this another judgment here is the bleakness of life. Notice with me 15. There's no peace. There's no health. There's no victory. Verse 15. We look for peace, but no good came. And for a time of health, and behold, trouble. The snorting of the, the horses, and it was heard from Dan. In other words, he's saying, 
way up in the north. Where did, where did Babylon come from? The north. Dan's in northern Israel, right? Lord of Judah. Uh, the land who trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones, for they are come. They have devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those that dwell therein. Then verse 15, Behold, I send serpents. I send serpents. I don't even like garter snakes. You know what I'm saying? They scare me. You know? I mean, they don't hurt me, but uh, I don't like them. You know? Uh, but cockatrices, this is the poisonous snakes among you, which shall not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. They shall bite you. The bleakness of life. No peace, no health, no victory. Well, why is all this? The contrivances, the covetousness, the bitterness, the barrenness, the bleakness. Why? Because they rejected the Bible. They rejected the Word of God. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? And then continuing on here, let's look at the condemnation. Notice specifically their rejection. What it says in verses 18 and 19. When I would comfort myself against, my, against sorrow, my heart is faint within me. Behold the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people, because of them that dwell in a far country. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with their strange vanities? Well, I thought that says you're going to have to know graven image before you. Isn't that the second commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me or the idea there before me or beside me. That's the word of God. You say, well, pastor, uh, even in the New Testament, the apostle John writing his first letter, 1 John 5, 21 says, he's writing the believers. You know, he says, little children, keep yourselves from what? Idols. Idols, that's a command. Anything or anyone that comes between God and us is an idol. It could be a person. It could be a thing. God has to be first in our lives. He has to be. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. The rejection. They rejected God. They rejected his truth. And what was their result? Verses 20 and 21. Notice this is sad. The harvest is past. In other words, what it was saying is, you know what? It's too late. It's too late. It's too late. Folks, when you hear the word of God, they say, well, I'll put that off. I'll put that off. Yeah, I know. I'll put that off. You know, behold, the day is the day of salvation. Amen? And by the way, the apostle Paul in Corinthians is quoting Isaiah. That when we hear the gospel, that's when we're to believe the gospel. Okay, we don't have any guarantees for tomorrow. We don't. No one, none of us do. But the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Boy, that would be a message in and of itself. Uh, um, for the hurt of the daughter of my people, am I hurt? I am black. Astonishment hath taken hold of me. It's too late. It's too late. However, sadly. Notice the refusal of restoration. And this is where I want to focus in on the next couple minutes. Very, very important. Notice with me, please. It says this. Is there no balm in what Gilead? Now you say, what? What's that talking about, Pastor Golden? Well, Gilead was the area northeast of the Jordan. That was the, the area they're talking about. That was Gilead. And balm was a type of... <clears throat> of plant or that was used for medicine for medicine and it says this is there no bomb in Gilead well wait a minute isn't, isn't there a plant balsam bomb in Gilead well yeah well, yeah that's true that's yeah that's right yeah well there is there there is medicine in Gilead okay yeah uh -huh. physically right uh, is there no physician there well wait a minute uh, uh, physicians use what medicine don't they they use medicine all right why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered wait a minute there's medicine it can help you but they don't use it there's medicine and it can help you but they don't use it now let me ask you something how many have ever been sick <laughs> no okay no. okay we've all been sick right 
And how many have you taken medicine and it's helped you? Right. Amen, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because in other words, you don't feel well, you have an illness, and you take medicine and it helps you to feel better. It helps you to get better, right? Physically. Physically. Well, what's this really talking about? Is this really dwelling? Now, for example, physically, this bomb, balsam bomb, this helped out with some physical ailments, such as it could help out with snake bites. It could help out with pleurisy, which is like, like a, a, almost like in pneumonia, cough, sciatica, with a back trouble, epilepsy, vertigo, asthma, and the flu. And the flu. It was a, a medicine that could be used for many, many things. But there is something ironic. Well, there is something that you have to do with medicine. You got to what? You got to receive it. You got to take it. Here you have an illness and say, oh, there's the medicine. Okay, but you don't take it. Is it going to help you? No, you yourself. I can't take the medicine for you, can I? You can't take the medicine for me. You yourself have to take that medicine. Well, I think we see very the spiritual application so well. And uh, let, let's look at this. This is not in our hymn books, and I put the words in here. I've heard, I haven't heard this hymn in a long time. But notice what it's saying. In other words, the balm in Gilead, just as we are sick physically, when we are sick spiritually, guess what? We have to take the medicine uh, we have to take the medicine spiritually. And you know what that medicine is spiritually? It's God. And as New Testament believers, it's God through whom? The Lord Jesus Christ. It's through Christ. It's through Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the what? No man cometh a father but by what? Me. It's through Christ. It's through Christ. But I have to receive him. I am a sin-sick soul. You are a sin-sick soul. But if we take Christ, he helps our sin-sick soul. That's why he came, to die for our sin and to rise again. And this old spiritual says this, is there, there is a bomb in Gilead. It's there to make the wounded whole. There's a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. Don't ever feel discouraged, for Jesus is your friend. And if you lack knowledge, he'll never refuse to lend. On the next page, on page four, if you cannot preach like Peter, if you cannot pray like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus and say he died for all. That's what it's all about. Accepting God's medicine. Accepting God's balm for the soul. And that's the Lord himself. Even Jonah said, salvation is of the what? Lord. Jonah 2.9. It's from God. God is the one. Now go back real quickly with me, please, uh, to page 2, the bottom of page 2. You see, the medicine was there. You see, God was there. Come to me. Get right with me. Repent. Believe me. Trust me. Put your faith in me. But here it is the end. But they refused to use and apply the cure. Note the invitation is from God himself. Now, I want you to turn real quickly, okay? I want to go through these verses real quick. But would you notice with me, please? Isaiah chapter 1. Can you turn there real quick? 150 years before, Isaiah says this. Now, I want you to notice that it's God himself who is offering us the medicine. It's God himself who is offering the cure for a sin-sick soul. It is God himself who is offering to be for us to know him, to have a relationship with him. And it's God himself who offers to restore our fellowship with him. Isn't that exciting? 
That is so wonderful. But I want you to notice in Isaiah 1, verses 16, I have the references there. I'll read it real quick. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil from your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fathers, plead for the widow. He's saying, hey, get right with me. Go by my word, right? But verse 18, notice what it says in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now, let us reason together. Saith the Lord, though your sins be as dark red, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, shiny red, they shall be as wool. I want you to notice it's God himself who gives the invitation, isn't it? Who says, get right with me. Have a relationship with me. Have, a, have fellowship with me. Your fellowship restored. And then real quickly, I just want to read uh, uh, Isaiah 55 where it says, you don't have to turn there, I'll just read it. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no medicine, uh, he that hath no money, excuse me, come ye, buy, eat, yea, buy wine and milk without money, without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and you labor for that which satisfieth not? Why, why, are, you, why are you living life without me? That's what he's saying. Hearken diligently unto me, that ye eat that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, come unto me. This is God saying this. Come unto me, hear, and your soul shall live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him why he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Isn't that wonderful? You see, God is the one that says, let's have a relationship. Let's have a fellowship with one another. Amen? And real quickly, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. This is a parable. Remember what a parable is, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning and one main point. Okay, it's just a regular story. Think of, by the way, parallel parable, same root idea, going the same way. Parallel lines, going the same way. An earthly, it's just a regular story with a spiritual or heavenly meaning and one main point. And notice, I'm going to read this real quick, and you follow with me, please. This is Luke 14, 15 through 24. And one of them that sat at meat with him, he saith, uh, 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 I'm sorry, verse 16, verse 16. Then he said unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many. So this fellow has this giant feast. He says, hey, I want people to come. I want people to come. It's probably a smorgasbord or something like that. A giant buffet, okay? And he sent his servant at supper time, say to them that were bidden, hey, come, for all things are now ready. Yeah, the dinner's ready. The feast is here, okay? Wow, that's exciting, all right? But then wh notice what happened. Notice what the result of, of, this, of this Lord, this master, inviting people. When they want to come, when they want to come, wow, that... Man, free meal. All right. <laughs> no. Okay. I, I don't know if I was thinking that, but okay. And then, and as they with one consent began to make excuse. Make excuse. Oh, no. I, and notice the excuses that they came across. The first said, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go needs and see it. I pray thee, me excuse. Now, how, how, how many of you would buy a piece of ground and not see it? Or not investigate it, right? Of course you wouldn't do that. Oh, I got, I, I got to go invest. I, I bought this piece of land. No. And then there's the other excuse. And the other one says, I have bought five oxen, five yoke of oxen, and go to prove them. That means test them. And I pray thee, have me excused. How many of you would buy a car and not test it? Or buy an oxen? I said, improve it, not test it. No, you, you, would, you wouldn't do that. You say, I, I got I'm not going to buy that until I test it, until I, I have proof that it's, it's good. I'm getting a good deal. And then another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Now, that guy probably had the best, best excuse. Nah, just kidding. <laughs> I got to check out when my wife is here. Hey, maybe, 
And you know what I, you know what he should have said? Oh, I'd love to come. Hey, I just got married. Can I? And do you think the master would say, no, you can't bring your wife? I think he would say, sure, absolutely. The more the merrier. Amen? And then, so the servant came and said, Lord, the master of the house saying, he uh, showed him, he said, look at, well, nobody can come. What? And the master of the house began to say it. His, and go out quickly into the street. He became angry and said, you know what? Go to the streets, the lanes, and bring in the poor, the maim, and the halt, and the blind. Uh, bring anybody. Bring whoever is there. And, and, uh, and, and so, uh, uh, and the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there's room. I've done that, Lord, and, and there's still room. We, we can still have more people come to this feast. All right? And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be full. Keep on inviting. Keep on inviting. There's plenty of room. Do you think there's plenty of room in heaven? There sure is. For anybody that wants to go there, if they want to go there, they can get there. They can go there. For I say unto you that none of those men, this is sad, which were bidden, they were invited, they shall taste of my supper. And they, in other words, he's saying those who've made excuses say, no, nope, can't come. They're not going to, they're not. See, folks, what's the illustration? And I'm, I'm finished, and you've been so attentive. The illustration is this. If you never come to Christ, you ain't, coming to he- you ain't going to heaven. That's what it is. The invitation is to come to Christ. If you come to Christ, you'll go to heaven. You'll come to Christ. Now, what's the practical illustration of this? Okay, if you see there the application, I have it. I have the other scripture listed about the prod. Remember, he said, "Well, is it the prodigal son, the extravagant son? Hey, Dad, give me what I want now." And what happened? He went out and blew it. Okay, wasted his riotous, ungodly, wicked living, and said, "Man, I messed up my life. Oh, boy, my father's hired servants got more than I do." What was the result when he went back to God? I mean, went back to his father. Well, in the the spiritual application, went back to God. The father said, hey, yeah. The father was glad he came back. You see, when you and I get away from God and we rebel against God, God's always there. And he's saying, come back to me. So a restored fellowship. God wants a restored fellowship. God wants a relationship with you and with me and with everyone. Simply this. Now, I have heard some of the best, most wonderful gospel messages ever in my life. I've heard some of them, and you have too. But guess what? There's something missing. The preacher leaves the people with nothing to do. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about. No invitation. No invitation. Oh, I, I've heard some of the most wonderful gospel messages. But what do I do with the death, burial, and bodily resurrection of Christ? There's the historical truths. This is what happened. God did it for you. But you see, you yourself must come to Christ. You yourself God is the one. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, are heavy laden. The invitation. So we give the invitation. Don't you just love? And one of the, one of the um, blessings I love about Pastor Wendell is he always gives invitations. Amen? Amen? Now some of you know, some of you, you, you I, I think you know what I'm talking about. Because a lot of you are from churches where you never heard invitations. Say amen. Amen. And some of you know your churches that you used to go to used to give invitations, but they don't anymore. And you know who they are. I think when we witness, when we preach, now I'm preaching to the choir tonight, and if you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior, make sure you have it. Don't, don't leave here. 
You say something to me, say, Pastor Colton, I want Jesus as my Savior. I'd be glad to lead you in prayer. People make fun of that. They make fun. Oh, just say a prayer and go to heaven. Well, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And by the way, we ever stop giving invitations here, I'm out of here. I'm going to tell you right now. And I'll stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. There was a church in Florida that Pam and I went to a couple of years. And you know I told her? By the way, the graduates are from a church, a college in Florida. I'm going to be blunt. I said, honey, I'm not going back to that church because I can't get saved. I don't know what to do with Jesus Christ. My wife and I are from liberal Protestant backgrounds. We wouldn't know what to do and said, you need to ask Jesus to be your Savior. And when we witness, I've had people say, and draw in the net. What does, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be as practical here and loving as I can. When you and I witness, it's a lot easier for me to preach to the whole crowd than it is for one-on-one. -on -one. But when you, when you talk, when you witness, and you get an opportunity to give the gospel, you should say to that person, Sir, would you want to trust Jesus as your Savior? I've had people say this, um, and I can't force them. It has to be them. But they say, um, no, uh, I have to think about this a little bit more. Thank you for asking. I said, okay. But I said, make sure you do. Sometime, you never know. You, you, again, we don't know guarantees for tomorrow. But I've also said to folks, I said, sir, ma'am, would you like to ask Jesus to be your Savior? And you know what I've had people say? I sure will. Would. I sure would. Isn't that wonderful? So let's not quit. Let's not give up on the Word of God giving invitations. Okay? Whether preaching or witnessing. Preaching or witnessing. Most Bible-believing churches do not give invitations. You know what I'm talking about. They don't. And they're taught that. They're taught not to do it. In some of our schools that we would approve, they're taught, don't you do it. I don't know why. I don't, that's, that's out of the pit of hell. That's from the devil. He doesn't want people deciding for Christ. He doesn't want people trusting for Christ. But may we always, always have love in our hearts and invite people to Christ. And if you haven't been saved, I invite you to ask him right now to be your Savior. Jesus, I believe you died for me. We're buried, rose again. Please come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Childlike faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the Word of God. Thank you that you are the one that loved us so much. And you are the one that beckons us to come to you. And Lord, if we come to you, you will receive us. You will not reject us. Help us to always be sensitive to your word, to your truth. Thank you for these dear folks. Please help us in preaching. Please help us in our witnessing to, to tell people the gospel and, Lord, to encourage them to trust your Son as their Savior. Thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.